Lin, Medical Director of the Toronto Center for Substance Use and Pregnancy at St. Joseph's Health Center in Toronto and Associate Professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. The presentation will cover methadone and buprenorphine in pregnancy and during lactation. The goal of my presentation is to provide you with an evidence-based review of the management of opioid use disorders during pregnancy, specifically to describe the prevalence of opioid use during pregnancy, followed by an approach to care for substance use disorders in pregnancy, including pharmacotherapy options. I will also discuss risk and benefits of methadone buprenorphine therapy, as well as pregnancy-specific considerations. If opioid use precedes pregnancy, I think it is important to review the prevalence of opioid dependence in a general population. Early data from the OPCAM study published in 2005 demonstrated that the type of illicit opioid use varied by province. In Toronto, prescription opioid use was much more prevalent than in other cities like Vancouver. Later studies showed a growing concern about opioid misuse in Canada. The CAMH monitor from 2009 found that approximately 20% of Ontario adults reported pasture use of prescription opiate pain relievers, and 2% of these individuals were using for non-medical purposes. The Canadian Alcohol and Drug Use Monitoring Survey from 2009 also reported that 5% of Canadians reported pasture non-medical prescription opiate use. During pregnancy, the prevalence of opioid use disorders is hard to estimate. The numbers vary depending on the population studied and the method for detection of opiate use. Data from the United States shows that 4 to 5 percent of pregnant women have illicit drug use in the past 30 days of their pregnancy, and 1 to 2 percent again reporting non medical use of prescription opiates. The rates based on the U.S. National Survey on Drug Use and Health are very similar to some of the rates in the Canadian general population indicating that a significant proportion of pregnancies are exposed to continued opiate use. Another concerning indicator of the extent of opiate use during pregnancy comes from statistics related to the Ontario bed utilization for the management of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Recent data shows that 3% of neonatal beds were occupied by infants that were diagnosed with neonatal abstinence syndrome. This is concerning since the average length of stay for these neonates is approximately two weeks versus 1.4 days for a term newborn. The length of stay can be also very variable in some institutions like at St. Joe's that can be as long as 42 days. And centers with an interest in this area may have 10 to 20 percent of newborns admitted to their nursery with a diagnosis of neonatal absence syndrome or NAS. Pregnant substance using women are typically younger, single, and have lower educational and income levels. These women also report high rates of comorbid psychiatric conditions such as mood and anxiety disorders and eating disorders. They also have a history of childhood sexual abuse and trauma and a family history of substance use and psychiatric disorders. Many women will initiate substance use or opiate use as a result of traumatic life events. This may be an episode of physical or sexual abuse, sudden physical illness, an accident or disruption in their family life, which then leads to being raised in environments with heavy alcohol and drug use, and they also typically end up being with partners who are engaged in substance use. So as I mentioned, substance use precedes pregnancy, and this may be the first time they've actually dealt with that substance use disorder. Polysubstance use is also commonly reported among pregnant women with opiate dependence. They report regular alcohol and cigarette smoking. They also have comorbid drug use, such as marijuana, cocaine, and benzodiazepines. And a substantial proportion of women, even on opiate agonist treatment, still continue to use both licit and illicit substances. Some data has shown that approximately 90% of methadone-maintained pregnant women also smoke tobacco. And similarly, a high proportion of these women may still be using other prescription medications. One study which addressed the high incidence of common illicit drug use during pregnancy was performed by Brown in 1998, and they compared women who were on methadone maintenance to those who were exposed to cocaine and drug-free controls. Surprisingly, 84% of methadone-maintained pregnant women had positive toxicology testing before or at delivery. So about 40% were using cocaine, 
other opiates, and marijuana. And 90%, as I mentioned previously, were smoking cigarettes, and another 40% were reporting frequent marijuana use. These rates among methadone-exposed pregnancies are similar to those that we see with cocaine users. The single difference among cocaine users was a higher prevalence of alcohol use, approximately 13% of those pregnancies. And compared to cocaine users, more methadone pregnancies had concomitant use of heroin and other opiates. And fortunately, despite these differences in substance use, there were no significance in neonatal outcomes, including birth weight, gestational age at delivery, or the length of hospital admission among the three groups. Pregnant opiate using women encounter very many barriers to treatment. There's personal factors, so the way they look at their addiction, they feel a lot of guilt and shame about being an opiate user during pregnancy. Some are still in denial. They fail to acknowledge the extent of the problem of their opiate use. Interpersonal factors can also deter them from getting the right treatment. If they have family members who are not supportive, or if they feel losing their children to child welfare agencies, they're also less likely to reach out for help. Societal and system factors are also important in terms of barriers to treatment. Societal attitudes are significantly positive for stigma attached to substance use during pregnancy. Women who perceive a lot of negative attitude from service providers will also help them from disclosing their substance use. The lack of appropriate treatment services for pregnant women and their families and the lack of flexible services may also act barriers to treatment. I would like to emphasize some general principles when dealing with pregnant substance users, as these relate directly to barriers to treatment. It is important to use a non-judgmental approach and to be woman-centered, to focus on her needs and not just on those of the fetus. A harm reduction approach is also essential, such as the use of opiate agonist treatment, which can have a positive impact on both maternal and neonatal outcomes. It is important to engage the woman at her own stage of change and to help her move along the continuum from pre-contemplation to action and maintenance. Finally, these women have complex psychosocial needs and therefore benefit from comprehensive care. Pregnancy represents a window period of opportunity. This is a teachable moment when women have an increased perceived risk about their health and the health of their fetus. We know from the study conducted by Daly in 1998 that pregnant women are more likely to access long-term substance abuse treatment programs, such as methadone maintenance, and they're more likely to reaccess detox programs because of an interest in stopping drug use for their child's health and because of fear of child protection services. The study found that overall, substance abuse treatment was higher among pregnant women than non-pregnant individuals during a six-month period following initial detoxification. The management of opioid use disorders during pregnancy begins by managing opioid withdrawal, providing education about maternal and fetal effects, connecting these individuals to pharmacological maintenance options such as methadone buprenorphine, and helping them to connect to integrated care. Ideally, one-stop comprehensive care within one location would be the most effective method for treating these women. This kind of program may also be allowed to focus on determinants of health such as housing, their socioeconomic status, and also providing early childhood care. I would like to point out the new definition of opioid use disorders from the DSM-5. The DSM-5 has taken together opioid use and opioid dependence criteria to form a new definition of opioid use disorders. This is now a single entity on the continuum from mild to severe, depending on the number of symptoms. Out of 11 criteria, individuals need to meet two of those 11 criteria over a 12-month period in order to be deemed opioid use disorder. If they have two to three symptoms from the 11, then they would be considered mild, four to five symptoms moderate, and six or more severe. The 11 criteria are very similar to those previously identified in opioid abuse and opioid dependence from DSM-4 and can be readily accessible um, through the DSM-5. Opioid withdrawal really needs to be identified early on when treating pregnant women. Typically, opioid withdrawal presents with physical symptoms like a flu-like illness, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, myalgias, rhinorrhea. There's also psychological symptoms such as anxiety, insomnia, and strong drug cravings. And it's these drug cravings and the lack of physical comfort that will lead to a high risk of relapse. Pregnancy-specific symptoms are also very worrisome. These include uterine irritability, leading to an increased risk of miscarriage, premature labor, fetal distress, and even fetal demise. The onset and duration of opioid withdrawal symptoms is related to that opiate half-life. 
So for example, for a short-acting opiate, the onset of withdrawal may be within several hours. For a long-acting agent, it may be onset within a few days. Opiate withdrawal management during pregnancy includes symptom-based treatment. So you can offer symptomatic relief until the symptoms improve or until another agent becomes effective. The typical cocktail that's recommended for nausea and vomiting includes diclectin and gravel, for loose stools, loperamide or imodium. Muscle aches can be treated with acetaminophen and buprenorphine up to the third trimester of pregnancy. However, if these patients develop more symptoms, such as uterine cramping, then opiate substitution treatment should be heavily encouraged. The risk of significant opioid withdrawal includes the risk of spontaneous abortion, field distress, premature labor, and even field demise. These theoretical risks were identified on early hair studies, where women went into severe withdrawal when they stopped heroin in the cold turkey approach. So therefore, women need to consider the risks and benefits of opioid withdrawal versus starting opiate agonist treatment. Opiate agonist treatment is a long-term commitment. It has been documented to improve maternal and neonatal outcomes, to improve treatment retention, and to decrease substance use compared to detoxification alone in pregnant opiate-dependent women. Currently, methadone maintenance treatment is the standard of care for pregnant opiate-using women. Buprenorphine is an alternative, however, this has to be considered only after discussion about risks and benefits. OAT is indicated in pregnant women who meet the criteria for opioid use disorders, as I mentioned previously, and this is definitely a harm reduction approach. It's not the ideal of not being on any medication. However, we know that with OAT, the possible benefits outweigh any of the risks involved in treatment. In the general population, the benefits of OAT have been very well documented through randomized controlled trials. OAT has been shown to relieve symptoms of opiate withdrawal and to reduce cravings for opiates. They also allow for normal function so individuals can perform their normal mental and physical tasks. It reduces the spread of bloodborne diseases and reduces social costs by reducing crime and improving social functioning. Initially, methadone maintenance treatment was developed for hair independence and then it was expanded to be used for prescription opiate use disorders. There's very little data in the field of prescription opiates, but here is one study published in 2009 that looked at the benefit of methadone maintenance treatment for prescription opiate use as well. This is a retrospective cohort study that was performed in the Washington State in the U.S. They compared those individuals who were on methadone maintenance treatment for prescription opiates to those who were taking it for heroin use. They found that prescription opiate users were younger, more often female and married, of Native American background, and they were more likely to have stable housing. Overall, they found there was no difference in treatment retention at 12 months by the opiate type, even adjusting for several variables. So this study has proven that methadone maintenance treatment is effective for prescription opiate dependence, just as it is for heroin dependence. The benefits of OAT in pregnancy include decreasing complications due to the repeated cycles of intoxication and withdrawal, as well as reducing the rates of prematurity, low birth weight, and infant mortality. It also allows women to engage in prenatal care and improve nutrition and decreases the risk of hepatitis C and HIV as it does in the non-pregnant populations. OAT is seen as a substitute for both heroin and prescription opiates. It accumulates in tissues with repeated daily oral administration. And once someone stabilized on the dose of methadone and buprenorphine, subsequent doses should not cause sedation, analgesia, or euphoria. Individuals should be able to function normally to carry out their daily tasks. So what is methadone? It is an oral synthetic opiate that acts just like morphine. It is dispensed as a liquid solution made by dissolving methadone in an orange drink. It is well absorbed from the GI tract within 30 minutes with a peak effect at 2-4 to four hours later. It has a long duration of action of 24-36 to 36 hours which makes it ideal for use in pregnancy. A study which compared the use of methadone versus heroin in pregnant women was done by uh, Fadjir Mirokun in 2006. They compared women who were stabilized on methadone to those who were still using heroin. The low numbers um, of the study is probably the biggest limitation in this data. They obviously found that women on methadone maintenance treatment had more antenatal visits, so about three more than people who were still using heroin, 
and there was a trend towards a reduction in heroin use and increased methadone dose by delivery in both groups of women. Infants who were exposed to heroin had higher mean NAS scores and were more likely to need treatment with morphine and as well had longer lengths of stay in the neonatal units. The majority of the babies in the methadone group were discharged from maternal custody, which is another desired outcome with methadone maintenance treatment during pregnancy. Similarly, during pregnancy, methadone has some not-so-pleasant side effects. These include constipation, sweating, fatigue. They also have the biggest risk, and that is of neonatal withdrawal, and we'll talk about that shortly. With people who have excessive doses of methadone, they will become more sedated and they'll have respiratory depression. And that's how we know that we've actually provided excessive doses of methadone and not an appropriate dose. There's several components to becoming involved in the methadone maintenance program. Frequency of MD visits is determined based on the clinical stability. At first, they may come to the office every one week and then they can be up to even four to 12 weeks thereafter. Each visit should include a review of their dose, relapse prevention counseling, and urine drug testing. Pharmacy visits will also depend on their stability, the number of drinks and carries. And the communication between the pharmacist and the physician is very critical. Pharmacists should be encouraged to report missed doses of the prescribing physician, so that can be addressed with the patient at their next visit. A treatment contract is also required, which indicates voluntary participation in methadone maintenance and obviously has some other behavioral expectations spelled out for patients. Initially, the patient, when they initiate methadone, will go to a pharmacy on a daily basis for a drink for the first two months at a minimum. That should be an observed intake of methadone to avoid drug diversion or overdose. Depending on their program, in the program, they can earn up to six take-home doses or carry doses. And that carry dose is a positive reinforcement for behavior change. And it also helps to reinforce functional stability. So it's not just stopping their drug use, but doing well with treatment, program attendance, cognitive stability, and also reintegrating into society. The biggest risk of methadone maintenance treatment is what happens after the baby is delivered. There's no increased risk of birth defects. There's been some reports of an association between methadone maintenance and an increased incidence of strabismus and nystagmus. The exact mechanism for these disorders is unknown at the present time. There's no obstetrical complications from using methadone in pregnancy. Infants still tend to be smaller on methadone maintenance than compared to controls, and these little deficits in birth weight and head circumference tend to catch up by the first year or two of life. Methadone crosses the placenta, and therefore a small amount of that methadone is delivered to the neonate. So when the neonate is delivered, they will have neonatal withdrawal, and this is reported in 40 to 90% of infants exposed to methadone in utero. Therefore, the neonate has to be observed as an inpatient for a minimum of four to five days after birth. Only a small percentage of neonates will require treatment and a more prolonged admission, and this is something that we can't avoid, unfortunately, with the use of methadone during pregnancy. At the present time, there's no conclusive evidence about the effect of methadone on long-term neurological and developmental outcomes, and I think it's pretty reassuring to individuals that these babies will do well if they're raised in a very stimulating environment. When we start women doing pregnancy on methadone maintenance treatment, it's important to realize that they need access on an urgent basis. So these are individuals who need to initiate methadone within 24 or 48 hours of attending a service. They should not be delayed for one or two weeks because that will make a difference in their pregnancy outcomes. There's no demonstrated benefit of inpatient versus outpatient stabilization. It is sometimes depending on certain patient factors. For some individuals, inpatient initiation is just not feasible, they don't have childcare, they lack support from family members, or if they don't have access to the appropriate services in the hospital setting. For those in women who can be admitted to the hospital for initiating methadone, they would benefit from close monitoring of their withdrawal symptoms. They also allows to start investigations for maternal health and prenatal status, and allows them to connect with other team members such as the social worker. There's also a difference in methadone metabolism in pregnancy. There's lots of documented evidence around methadone clearance being increased from the first to third trimester, therefore resulting in lower plasma concentrations of methadone. Several explanations have been put forth for this change in metabolism in pregnancy. However, there's so far no concrete evidence that there's a relationship between maternal methadone dose at delivery and neonatal outcomes such as NAS. Therefore, the goal of 
dosing during pregnancy is to make sure that someone's clinically stable and that we reduce their relapse risk. So women can be reassured that reaching an adequate methadone dose is not in any way going to affect the outcome of that baby. Women who become symptomatic in their third trimester of pregnancy will need some dose adjustments, and this has been also documented in the literature. The dose adjustments are usually around 28 and 30 weeks of gestational age, and they can be one of two ways. The total methadone dose can be increased, or decreasing the dosing interval through split dosing can also be considered. Pregnant women should only be offered split dosing when the single-dose treatment approach does not seem to reduce their maternal withdrawal symptoms. However, we also have to realize that after delivery, these dose increase may also have to be reversed, usually about one to two weeks after delivery. There's been lots of benefits to split dosing identified from several studies. These include sustained plasma levels of methadone during pregnancy, reduced cocaine use as well with split dosing, and more stabilized fetal activity patterns. Split dosing, however, may not be appropriate for every patient. They have to be assessed for suitability in terms of their clinical stability, and also there's very little guidance in the literature about the optimal ratio for split dosing. This may be done in the 50-50 routine or a 30-70 routine, really depending on the individual needs. Replacement doses are also allowed for pregnant women, and this can be considered even if the emesis was not observed by any staff. And the reason that there is allowing for this kind of replacement dosing in pregnancy is because of the potential risk of opioid withdrawal. A general rule of thumb is that if the emesis occurred within 15 minutes after their methadone drink, a replacement of 50% of the full dose can be allowed. If it's within 15 to 30 minutes after their methadone drink, a replacement of 25 to 50% of the full dose is, can be considered and if the emesis is more than 30 minutes after the drink, then there's no indication for replacement dose. The decision to order a replacement dose must be made by a physician after consulting with the patient and the pharmacist. It should be only once a day that you replace the dose. And of course, if this request seems to be recurrent, then we need to assess the woman again for her stability status. It may require that we assess her carry status, and we look at why she may be having um, the vomiting in pregnancy. Also, we would consider treating her nausea prior to her daily drink, for example, pre-medicating with diaminhydronate, which is gravol before daily doses, or even considering restarting diclectin. Historically, methadone tapering was discouraged due to adverse pregnancy outcomes based on studies dating back to the 1960s and 1970s. However, newer evidence suggests that methadone detoxification may be a suitable alternative, especially for women who decline methadone maintenance treatment. Since the 1990s, there is a growing body of literature on the role of methadone detoxification during pregnancy, stemming from six studies and including 500 pregnant women. Recent findings demonstrated that detoxification was linked to clinical instability and to a high risk of relapse, which in turn may lead to resumption of methadone maintenance treatment. In addition, there was no significant adverse obstetrical or neonatal complications. These results can provide reassurance to women who may have a strong desire to consider methadone detoxification during pregnancy. The literature, again, provides very little guidance about the rate of methadone detoxification. The different studies followed very different dosing protocols, and therefore it's hard to determine what would be the optimal method. In general, based on the CPSO methadone guidelines, it is recommended that the methadone dose be decreased by 5 to 10% per week, and that this dose be very held if there's new withdrawal symptoms occurring, or if women need to consider having a longer taper if they seem to be having running into difficulty with their pregnancy as well. So tapering should only be attempted after discussing benefits and risk of opioid withdrawal during pregnancy versus continuing on opioid agonist treatment. Women need to agree that they will stop their taper if there's any adverse outcomes such as relapse to drug use, increased cravings, or any pregnancy-related withdrawal symptoms. We know that women who will typically do better with detoxification in pregnancy will have had short addiction histories, are stable medically and socially, and they have good support networks. So let's talk about buprenorphine, and I'm going to try and contrast buprenorphine to the use of methadone during pregnancy. So buprenorphine is a sublingual tablet. It was approved for use in Canada for non-pregnant populations in 2007. It is a partial mu receptor agonist, which relieves withdrawal symptoms and 
causes cravings for opiate use for more than 24 hours. It is rapidly absorbed when placed under the tongue with a peak effect in 1 to 4 hours and it also has a very long half-life of 24 to 60 hours. In contrast to methadone, buprenorphine has a ceiling effect, so a safe dose above which there's no further benefit. This is also safer in overdose, which may be beneficial for some individuals who are at higher risk of suicidal ideations and overdoses. There was a small body of evidence up to the 1990s which showed some promising effects of the use of buprenorphine during pregnancy. We know that buprenorphine can produce opiate-like effects equivalent to methadone by suppressing opiate use, so it's an effective opiate substitution therapy, but it also showed very little physical dependence and mild withdrawal in individuals who just suddenly stopped their buprenorphine use. And this is why individuals started considering the use of buprenorphine in pregnancy because of this promising evidence. So based on these early reports, they found that newborns who were exposed to buprenorphine had a shorter and milder neonatal absence syndrome than those who were exposed to methadone. And this gain would be beneficial both for families and infants, as well as for healthcare reduction in costs. So buprenorphine maintenance treatment has fewer restrictions than methadone maintenance treatment. Any physician can prescribe buprenorphine. However, it is recommended that they attend a prescribing course and a one-day clinical observation of an opiate dependency practice as well as engage in ongoing continuing medical education in opiate dependent treatment. All pharmacies should dispense this medication, and urine drug testing is also encouraged each visit, however, it's not a specific schedule as it is with methadone maintenance treatment. There are some contraindications to buprenorphine maintenance, including severe liver dysfunction and an acute severe re respiratory illness. Induction to buprenorphine maintenance treatment is slightly different than with methadone. A urine drug screen is required to show that it's positive for opiate use and also to rule out the presence of methadone or buprenorphine in their system. A written treatment agreement is also recommended just like with methadone. However, with buprenorphine, pregnant women need to present in moderate opiate withdrawal in order to avoid having precipitate withdrawal when they're actually being induced to buprenorphine. So that means that if the abstinence from short-acting medications for 6 to 12 hours and for up to 24 hours for more delayed release opiates. So pregnant women on methadone should not be transferred to buprenorphine because they need to be off methadone for three to five days after their last dose before they can start buprenorphine. And that's why there's a lot of controversy around safe induction during pregnancy with buprenorphine because of the risk of opioid withdrawal. Also, you can consider inpatient induction for buprenorphine if there is a significant risk of opioid withdrawal to that pregnant woman. At the present time, similarly, there's no studies about inpatient versus outpatient induction of buprenorphine. The COW scoring tool is used to assess the severity of opioid withdrawal and to guide the initiation of suboxone or buprenorphine. The initial induction dose is very similar as in the general population of 2 to 4 milligrams sublingually based on the COW score, and the dose should also be observed by the pharmacist when they're first being started. The patient should be reassessed an hour after the first dose and again three hours later, and if they still have significant opioid withdrawal symptoms, then an additional dose of 2 to 4 milligrams may be provided, up to a maximum of 8 milligrams on that first day. The patient should be then reassessed the next day for a dose increase. The full effect of a buprenorphine dose may not be evident until 3 to 5 days after repeated dosing, so as much as we want to be aggressive with our buprenorphine in induction, we want to be also safe. The optimal maintenance dose can lead to resolution of both opioid withdrawal symptoms as well as cravings. And the average maintenance dose that's been documented is 8 to 12 milligrams per day, up to a maximum dose of 24 milligrams. And similarly, as with methadone, there's no association between the daily buprenorphine dose and severity of NAS, so therefore the woman should aim for an appropriate dose that will keep her comfortable for a 24-hour time period. The buprenorphine dose will need to be adjusted during pregnancy, just as with methadone, in order to maintain 
therapeutic buprenorphine levels. Evidence from small, randomized controlled trials showed that a buprenorphine dose increase of up to 6 mg may be required when transitioning from the first to the third trimester of pregnancy. On average, a 2 mg dose increase was required in the third trimester of pregnancy. Currently, buprenorphine is not readily available at the pharmacy. It's only available as a combination product called Suboxone. And the naloxone part of this medication is to deter intravenous use. However, we don't have any safety data during pregnancy, and therefore pregnant women should not be initiated to, co to this combination product. They should be considered for use of Subutex or the buprenorphine mono product. If a woman is on Subutex prior to her pregnancy, then she should stay on this treatment, but if she's on Suboxone, she does need to be switched to Subutex again because of the unknown safety of naloxone. During pregnancy, the buprenorphine can be provided at no cost from the manufacturer for the duration of the pregnancy only. This requires that the healthcare provider submits an application for approval to obtain the Subutex, which is then shipped to the provider who has made the application. The doctor is responsible for safekeeping and dispensing of buprenorphine to the pregnant woman, and immediately in the postpartum period, she needs to be switched back to Suboxone, and the remainder of the Subutex needs to be shipped back to the manufacturer. The buprenorphine medication has been documented across the placenta, and therefore we know that the baby also gets a proportion of that medication. However, this is a very small amount of the medication that is transferred to the fetus. Similarly, there's no associated teragenicity with the use of buprenorphine during pregnancy, and birth parameters with buprenorphine tend to be within normal range and very similar to those we see with methylene exposure in pregnancy. Neonatal abstinence syndrome is also seen with perineal use of buprenorphine, but we're hoping that it'll be reduced severity. In 2003, a systematic review was published of 21 reports on the use of buprenorphine during pregnancy, and these early studies consisted of 300 infants that were exposed to buprenorphine. They found that NAS was reported in approximately 60% of infants, but only 50% of these required treatment for NAS. The NAS was also appearing within the first 12 to 48 hours, it peaked at 72 to 96 hours, and it lasted for 120 to 96 hours. So the time for NAS associated with buprenorphine is also very similar to what we've seen with methadone. This led to a landmark study in pregnancy called the MOTHER study. In this double-blind, double-dummy, randomized controlled trial, they tried to focus on comparing NAS after methadone in comparison to buprenorphine. There were eight sites. One site in Canada, which included our hospital, one site in Austria, and there were six sites in the USA. In total, 175 pregnant women ran randomized to either buprenorphine or methadone, and there were no significant differences in the two groups in terms of their characteristics. One of the main findings in the study was the differences in retention and care. More women in the buprenorphine group discontinued treatment in comparison to those in the methadone group. The satisfaction with the study medication was the primary reason for discontinuing the study. Doses at the study discontinuation were quite adequate, 87 mg for those on methadone and 14 mg for women on buprenorphine. When we look at neonatal outcomes, the percentage of neonates who required treatment for withdrawal did not differ between the two groups, but the biggest significant findings were that neonates who were exposed to buprenorphine required 90% less morphine, they spent approximately 40% less time in the hospital, and had also 60% less time in the hospital receiving medication for NAS. So even though the number of neonates requiring treatment did not differ, buprenorphine did result in a clinically reduced severity of NAS. Tapering of buprenorphine maintenance treatment during pregnancy has been also requested. However, at the present time, there hasn't been much evidence around its use of, in terms of the detoxification protocol in pregnancy. Systematic reviews in the non-pregnant population have shown that um, slower buprenorphine dose reduction are associated with less severe withdrawal symptoms, and this 
has yet to be studied in pregnant women. Long-term outcome studies of buprenorphine tapers have shown that those individuals who were able to detoxify using buprenorphine um, did not have higher rates of abstinence following withdrawal. So again, we have to be very careful who we would be considering for a, for a buprenorphine taper. It may be individuals who have to be clinically stable before considering to lower their buprenorphine dose. So as I mentioned, there's no studies about buprenorphine tapering during pregnancies at the present time. You need to consider benefits and risk of the buprenorphine detoxification versus continuing on this medication throughout the pregnancy. And we know that longer treatment with buprenorphine maintenance is associated with increased absence rates in the general population, and we would expect the same outcomes also in pregnant populations. There's also very little literature on the long-term effects of buprenorphine maintenance treatment. At the present time, there's only three studies reported, which included a total of 20 infants. The three studies followed infants up to the age of five only. Most of these infants reached developmental milestones as expected, and there was one study which reported transient motor abnormalities from age three to nine months. The use of buprenorphine and naloxone combination product during pregnancy is starting to be studied. So at the present time, we don't have a lot of information. However, we know that we do not want to offer naloxone just before delivery because of the risk of fetal asphyxia and therefore leading to respiratory failure of the newborn. At the present time, there are two retrospective chart reviews that have addressed the use of combination product during pregnancy. The current total sample size consists of 41 exposed pregnant women. In these pregnancies, infants were born at term with normal birth parameters and no birth defects were detected. Up to 40% of neonates were treated for neonatal abstinence syndrome. Comparable rates reported to buprenorphine monoproduct and to methadone. Obviously, more studies are needed to confirm the safety of the combination product during pregnancy. So based on the literature review from these small sample sizes, there are no significant adverse and maternal fetal outcomes identified. However, as I said, we need to wait for more safety data. It's also important to realize that opiate agonist treatment needs to be continued throughout the labor and delivery process. So women need to have the same dose when they're in labor. They need to also have their pain managed appropriately. So additional analgesics are required to treat the acute pain of labor and that their current maintenance medication is not effective. They may also require larger and more frequent doses of analgesics during interpartum and also during the postpartum period. Evidence around pain management during the interpartum and postpartum period comes from three retrospective data analyses, which showed that there was no differences in pain scores for vaginal delivery. They found that women used epidural anesthesia more frequently, and following vaginal delivery, buprenorphine maintained women did have more pain but did not require more medication. Following C-section, women on buprenorphine had increased pain, and they also required more use of NSAIDs and opiates during the first days postpartum in comparison to non-opiate-maintained pregnant women. However, when we look at buprenorphine versus methadone-maintained women, there was no differences in pain severity or opiate use postpartum, but interestingly, methadone-using women required higher doses of ibuprofen for managing the pain. The safety of methadone and buprenorphine also has to be considered for women when they're looking at breastfeeding. We know breastfeeding promotes interaction and bonding between the mother and infant. It provides passive immunity and protects against other things like otitis media, allergies, asthma, and sudden infant death syndrome. Breastfeeding should be encouraged as long as the mother's HIV negative and there's no other active drug use or other contraindications. Methadone has been detected in breast milk in very low concentrations, even at high doses of methadone use. So infants receive a very small amount of the ingested methadone dose. Based on some of the literature, it's less than 0.1 milligram per kilogram per day of the methadone dose via breast milk. And the amount of methadone in the breast milk is not enough to prevent neonatal withdrawal, so therefore even breastfed methadone-exposed infants will still require observations for NAS and may still require opiate treatment. The breastfeeding process may be more difficult for methadone-exposed infants because of their withdrawal symptoms, so women may need a lot of support and encouragement to continue breastfeeding while infants are experiencing NAS. Since the benefits of breastfeeding outweigh any possible risk, it's important to encourage women to breastfeed on methadone maintenance treatment regardless of the methadone dose. 
and at the present time, the long-term effect of exposing infants to a small amount of methyl in the breast milk is yet to be determined. Buprenorphine used during lactation has been less well studied. We know that buprenorphine and its metabolite have been detected in breast milk at low levels as well, but they're also at similar levels to maternal plasma. And we know that buprenorphine is also present in breast milk two hours after ingestion. However, since buprenorphine has a very poor oral bioavailability, the neonates is exposed to a much smaller proportion of the amount of buprenorphine that was ingested. The current literature reports on 40 to 50 women who breastfed on buprenorphine maintenance treatment. And the outcomes show that there was no difference in NAS severity and treatment rates based on breastfeeding status alone, but there was a trend that infants who were breastfed had less severe NAS and were less likely to need pharmacological treatment for NAS. The buprenorphine in the breast milk did not suppress the NAS, but we also know that it may reduce the severity. So given this limited literature, women need to consider again risk and benefits of breastfeeding versus the buprenorphine exposure in the breast milk, and this is regardless of the buprenorphine dose. So as I mentioned, neonatal absence syndrome is the biggest complicating factor when using buprenorphine or methadone or any other opiates during pregnancy. NAS has been reported in up to 40 to 90% of infants exposed to opiates in utero. Untreated withdrawal can cause seizures and even fetal death. And at the present time, there's no long-term sequelae after resolution of NAS. We also have to be aware that non-opiate drug exposure such as cocaine, benzodiazepine, and marijuana used in pregnancy may also affect the NAS presentation and its severity. NAS is characterized by three very typical symptoms, central nervous system hyperitability, which is determined by increased muscle tone and tremors, GI dysfunction, which is demonstrated by poor feeding, regurgitation on loose stools, as well as metabolic, vasomotor, and respiratory disturbances. The onset of symptoms and sign depends on the half-life of the opiate used, and there's even the presentation of up to two weeks postpartum, which is possible. So the recent mother study from 2010 suggested that the rates of NAS among infants exposed to buprenorphine and methadone were not any different, but we know from these RCT that buprenorphine may result in less severe NAS compared to methadone, and this is why buprenorphine is becoming a highly favorable medication during pregnancy. So NAS can be complicated by polydrug use. Neonatal symptoms may be more severe with polydrug use, especially if combined with opiates and benzodiazepines. A study published by Vachman in 2011 showed that maternal use of methadone and other psychiatric medications increased the average length of stay to up to one week. Combine methadone with SSRI, the length of stay increases to 27 days. Combine benzos to 29 days and with other psychiatric medications up to 28 days in comparison to an average of 23 days with methadone alone. Therefore, it's important to emphasize to women for them to be on methadone alone if possible and to avoid the use of psychoactive medications unless there's a clear psychiatric diagnosis. The Provincial Council for Maternal and Child Health has put together some neonatal care recommendations for the management of NAS, and I want to review some of these guidelines from the PCMCH. They do recommend that pregnant women should be educated about the risk of neonatal withdrawal if in an opiate substitution program or if they're using any other opiates on a regular basis during pregnancy. It's important for women to be prepared for what to expect in the postpartum period. Women should be aware that their infants will need to be observed for a minimum of five half-lives, and this is so that we can assess for the presence and the severity of newborn withdrawal symptoms. Non-pharmacological interventions are the first line. This includes swaddling, cuddling, and reducing sensory stimulation environment. Therefore, parents are encouraged to take an active role in caring for their newborns while they're admitted to the hospital and to provide those supportive measures. We know from firsthand experience that mothers who tend to be more involved in newborn care will have infants who are more easily settled. Pharmacotherapy should be considered for the treatment of NAS when supportive measures have failed to adequately reduce the signs of withdrawal. So these babies then would need to be monitored more frequently and more intensively, and they should be treated with morphine as a first-line agent. Comprehensive care has also been shown to overcome barriers to care for pregnant substance-using women and to improve coordination of fragmented services. Several studies have documented that adding prenatal care to addiction treatment will improve pregnancy outcomes and reduce drug use by 
delivery. Programs that have also focused on psychosocial needs have also been showing more beneficial outcomes. Integrated care programs have been highly recommended based on evidence from meta-analysis that have found that women who attend integrated programs have improved neonatal outcomes such as higher birth weights and fewer birth complications, as well as improved maternal outcomes such as fewer positive drug screens, more prenatal visits, and fewer preterm births. So comprehensive programs that combine pregnancy care with substance use treatment in one location are the ideal model for providing care to women with opioid use disorders. So the literature has very many gaps for pregnant women. There's lots of areas for further research, including what's the most effective pharmacotherapy agent for the management of these disorders during pregnancy? What is the appropriate induction process specifically when it comes to buprenorphine during pregnancy? Also, safety data is hugely lacking with buprenorphine exposure during pregnancy and during lactation. And what is the effect of comorbid alcohol and benzodiazepine exposure? Also, long-term effects of opiate agonist exposures have not been readily identified, and more research is needed in all of these areas. So then to conclude, methadone maintenance treatment remains the standard of care and leads to higher retention and treatment. Buprenorphine may be associated with less severe withdrawal, but the evidence is still too limited and therefore should be considered after discussion of benefits and risks. The safety of the buprenorphine naloxone combination product is still to be investigated and it's not recommended in pregnancy. And so at the present time, the monoproduct of buprenorphine is strongly recommended in pregnancy over the combination product. And urgent access to OAT during pregnancy is critical. Referral to an integrated treatment program is ideal, but if that's not available in your community, finding a prenatal care provider who is friendly with methadone buprenorphine is also greatly appreciated. And methadone So then to conclude, methadone maintenance treatment remains the standard of care and leads to higher retention and treatment. Buprenorphine may be associated with less severe withdrawal, but the evidence is still too limited and therefore should be considered after discussion of benefits and risks. The safety of the buprenorphine naloxone combination product is still to be investigated and it's not recommended in pregnancy. And so at the present time, the monoproduct of buprenorphine is strongly recommended in pregnancy. Referral to an integrated treatment program is ideal, but if that's not available in your community, there's a whole host of online resources where you can obtain more information in this area, including guidelines from the SOGC, from the Ontario NAS guidelines, and as well as from the PRIMA project. There's also the CAMH Addiction Toolkit available and the CANADAPT guidelines on smoking cessation in pregnancy. There's a couple of pregnancy-specific clinical resources available as well. The TCAP program is a program that I am involved with at St. Joseph Health Center. We take phone and email consultations. There's the mother risk clinical consultations process as well, as well as in the City of Toronto, Breaking the Cycle and the Pathways to Healthy Families provide counseling services to pregnant and parenting women. My name is Mary Nelson and I work part-time at the Burlington Family Health Team. 